The following and all of our free content is brought to you by our sponsors and our patrons over at patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg. When you can't come to Gettysburg, we want to bring Gettysburg to you, but that requires people and your support. So go to patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg and please become a patron today. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all so much for joining us this afternoon. Uh, it's always a treat to see so many of you here for the Winter Lecture Series. We are very fortunate to have with us today Superintendent Ernie Price, who has traveled all the way from the wilds of Kentucky to be with us this afternoon. He mentioned that the entire drive was snowing, uh, so I think it's only appropriate that it's snowing now as he's about to speak. Uh, Ernie is originally from Lynchburg, Virginia. He holds an undergraduate degree in history from Longwood College and a Master of Education degree from Lynchburg College. His time with the National Park Service has taken him from the National Mall in Washington, D.C., to the Natchez Trace, Richmond National Battlefield, Roosevelt, uh, Vanderbilt, National Historic Site, El Moro, National Monument, and more. He was the Chief of Education and Visitor Services at Appomattox Courthouse, where he earned the prestigious Freeman Tilden Award. If you don't know what that is, it's kind of like the Academy Award for being a good interpretive ranger. It's the highest that we get. And, and Ernie won it in 2015. In 2020, he was named the new superintendent of Camp Nelson National Monument in Kentucky, one of the newest additions to the National Park Service system, which is what brings him to our lecture series today. He has been incredibly generous with his time, his talents, his expertise. Uh, so it's my pleasure to welcome Ernie Price to the Winter Lecture Series. <clears throat> Excellent. Great. Thank you, Chris, for that introduction. Uh, how are the acoustics? It's a beautiful room. You hear me okay? Excellent. Good to hear. Uh, thanks for coming in from uh, out of the very cold and windy and snowy day. Uh, pardon me, I may have a little round top hair right now. Uh, <laughs> great to have my wife and my uh, daughter here with me. So doing a little touring, taking advantage of the trip. So yeah, as Chris said, it was a, a winter wonderland coming across Kentucky and West Virginia and Western Maryland to be here, but it is, it's thrilling to be here. And Chris, let me know if I disconnect that wire again. Um, how many people in this room have ever been to Camp Nelson? Okay. Three more than I thought. Excellent. All right. Well, this is actually good because I was kind of banking on that you hadn't been there before. So, um, yeah, so my, my goal today, and again, I I very much appreciate uh, Chris inviting me here and the park uh, to have the opportunity to share Camp Nelson's story because it is a relatively new unit to the National Park Service. So um, we as Park Service employees are not really marketers by trade, but I think we do need to do a little marketing here so people can understand a little bit more about what Camp Nelson is. And that's my goal today is just to take some time to do that. <clears throat> and for those of you that have been there, uh, bear with me. Um, this is a bit of a visual introduction to the park, but I'd like to dive into some of its history. And as someone who's worked at C Civil War sites in the Park Service, Camp Nelson offers some pretty special chances to explore other things, primarily because it's not a battlefield. How crazy is that? Um, and, and it is. So things like the logistics of war, uh, the process of emancipation, uh, refugees stories of the war are, can all be center stage at Camp Nelson. Those are primary themes, not secondary or tertiary. So it's kind of interesting. Uh, and I actually have to remind myself quite often that we're not interpreting a battlefield. So it's a, every day when I go to work is a different mindset. Um, so, and I think it's, I think it is an opportunity. So <clears throat> greetings from the bluegrass Commonwealth. And I learned when I got there, I am originally, as Chris said, from Virginia. Uh, I, I often feel like that there's a bit of a twilight zone, uh, you know, picture, if you will, a commonwealth beyond sight and sound. And it's, it's new Virginia. Uh, no offense to Kentuckians, but uh, I grew up in a part of Virginia that could be described as being between Lexington, Danville, and Richmond. And now I live in Kentucky between Danville, Lexington, and Richmond. <laughs> but in this twilight version, Lexington's bigger than Richmond. Um, the only, the big, other big difference is the sun rises over the mountains instead of sets on them. But otherwise, you know, rolling hills, tobacco fields, um, 
a lot of the place names are, are the same. It's, it's kind of kind of interesting. So um, yeah, let's let's jump into the program itself. This is what we look like at our entrance. Um, you know, Kentucky is is very complicated in the Civil War. Uh, and I, I, that, that still strikes me uh, every day uh, that I'm there and, and trying to understand more and more about it. <clears throat> you know, we, my family and I, we, we did the film and the cyclorama earlier this morning, and uh, it was just nice to, to share this with my daughter. Um, and I'm reminded in discussions about the Emancipation Proclamation, but see, the thing is, Kentucky's not a state in rebellion, so the Emancipation Proclamation doesn't apply, but it's a slave state. See, I told you it's going to be complicated, um, and, and so that, that just keep that in your mind, you know, as we go through some of these some of these stories. But so yeah, you've got you've got enslaved people uh, in Kentucky during the war uh, that at least one gentleman will describe Camp Nelson as Canada. Uh, it's just a lot closer. Um, so uh, one thing I should say too, as uh, we look at a few pictures of the park, and I wanted this this entrance shot just because I figured most people wouldn't have been there. So uh, we're located about 18 miles south of Lexington. It was 18 miles in 1865, and it still is. Um, and it, it, we're not, I try to resist the urge to say that we're a park starting from scratch, because we're not. That would be an insult to the folks of Jesmond County, Kentucky, who actually started this park a little over 20 years ago. They bought up three farms and some other acreage that was the core of the camp, as you'll see. Uh, there's there's a, a, a frame building on the behind the column there in the far distance. That's the museum and the visitor center and kind of the headquarters of the park. Uh, the White House is actually a historic structure. It was there during the Civil War. Uh, we'll talk about that. And they have a parking lot. And so there is a physical park there. It's about 450 acres. Uh, which is the core of, of the original camp. So we, we're not starting from scratch, but what we are trying to do is make it into a national monument. And, and we do have some opportunities that I think the county didn't have, and they have been wonderful partners. The transition has been, been a lot of fun. Um, they, ha they had an archaeologist on staff for over 20 years, Dr. Stephen McBride. He's a great friend of the park, so our learning curve is steep, but with him, uh, we are managing uh, to learn more about the digs that he's done, and he also functioned as the historian as well as the archaeologist. And, and I'll say that, too, about the park. It's very much an archaeological site because the camp itself was intentionally dismantled at the end of the war, as we'll see. So uh, today there's a lot of rolling green pasture. And I think one of our challenges as, as administrators of the park is to provide opportunities for our visitors to understand what was there then, which is so different than what you see now. Uh, today, this rolling green pastures, you're seeing that. It's hard to imagine that there were times in the latter part of the Civil War that Camp Nelson was the second largest city in Kentucky. That's a hard sell when you go there today. Uh, but we'll, uh, let's just go through this, and, and you can see at the top, we'll go cover these major topics uh, with the hope that, that, that you'll be introduced well to, to what this park is, and I hope you'll be inspired to maybe visit uh, one day. We'd love to have you. Um, so, a little geography to get us started. We really are right in the middle of, the, uh, of Kentucky. Um, you know, one, one thing that I learned is I, I always have known Kentucky to be the bluegrass state, but there's actually a region in central Kentucky known as the bluegrass region, and that's where we are. Uh, I'm told it has to do with the limestone, and the water there is very special. Apparently, it's good for raising horses, and it's also necessary for making bourbon. Um, history, horses, and bourbon, that's, that's central Kentucky. The order can change depending on the day of the week or your mood. But um, anyway, 18 miles south of, of Lexington, uh, we were created officially by presidential proclamation on October 26, 2018 as the 418th unit of the National Park Service. I think we're up to 423 right now, if you're keeping score at home. Um, uh, incidentally, this map, there we are kind of in the middle, just south of us, about an hour and 15 minutes, is Mill Springs Battlefield National Monument, and they're even newer than we are. They're number 421. So we have a partner in crime over there as we grow together. Um, 
So the first permanent NPS National Park Service staff arrived at Camp Nelson in July of 2020, and that was me. Um, really, really interesting to, to, to be there. And, and since then, we have built our small staff. There's eight of us now. Um, and that will probably be the, the core of the staff going forward, uh, depending on, you know, budgets will come and go and rise and fall, and we'll adjust accordingly. But, but that just gives you a sense of, of, of who we are. And that's what it looks like at the entrance. There's the visitor center in the back, and there's the White House. Um, the White House, that's what it's called locally. That's what it was called during the Civil War. It's technically the Oliver Perry home, and uh, it was built in 1855, and it was used as officers' headquarters uh, during the Camp Nelson days. So I think that's critical because in a, in a site that is largely archaeological, it's nice to have that landmark on the landscape, and, and you'll see why as we go through so we're going to jump around here a little bit, um, talk a little bit about the, the ongoing creation of the National Monument. But of course, there was Camp Nelson's original creation. And as it turns out, it really coincides with, with Gettysburg on the timeline. This is an 1863 site. And you can see that um, just some bullet points here. Uh, I think one of the things you can look back if you trace back to some of the original thoughts and things that would lead to the necessity of Camp Nelson, it would be the fact that there was a Union sentiment in East Tennessee uh, as the war started. And Lincoln was aware of this and made it publicly known that uh, it was his intention to see East Tennessee liberated for the Unionist-minded folks in that part of the state. Uh, it didn't happen in 61, but as, as the war went on, that promise was still there. And General Burnside didn't have a great December 62 or January 63. And so when he was um, uh, sent west to Cincinnati, uh, he would become the guy at the right place at the right time to carry out this promise to, quote, unquote, liberate East Tennessee. That was the objective. So let's make that clear. Camp Nelson only ever existed for that purpose. That was its military purpose. Now, it's going to become other things as things change. But in 1863, that was the point. So Burnside uh, will arrive in the spring of 63, this is now the Department of the Ohio that he's got. Um, he is going to have two divisions of the Ninth Corps with him. That's what he envisions being the core of his new new command and the 23rd Corps. This is going to be the Army of the Ohio. Um, and, and, and that's how it all starts. Now, one thing to remember, he's in Cincinnati. He's looking toward Tennessee and envisioning how he's going to make this maneuver down there. And one thing you have to know, and you can't really tell it on this map very well because it's just too much of detail uh, to make out. But if, if you imagine uh, Lexington uh, there kind of in the middle, and then, of course, Knoxville is down here. Uh, Knoxville is, is really the target that he initially is, wants to go to and then operate out of there. There is no railroad that connects Lexington to Knoxville at the time. However, there is a railroad coming out of Lexington to Nicholasville, Kentucky. It's okay if you've never heard of that. Uh, that's about 12 miles south of Lexington. And, and the reason it's important is because Burnside will tell engineers, okay, the first thing we need to do is develop a large supply depot. And, and as you'll see, really an industrial center. And it needs to be south of Nicholasville. I, that's all I can tell you. That's all he told them. Go south of Nicholasville and find a spot for a, a large supply depot that we can launch uh, our, our campaign in East Tennessee from. And so that, that was the order uh, to do that. And with those instructions, the engineers found this spot. Now, pardon my scribbles, but these are the major points that will cause this to happen. Now, the, the big windy thing here that you're seeing, crazy winding thing, is the Kentucky River. The thing you don't notice as much on the map is Hickman Creek, smaller tributary here. But it's back to that limestone, okay? This is karst topography, they call it. And the thing about the, the, the river and the creek is they're not just that significant bodies of water. It's not the water that makes them important to our story. It's what they've done to the land. They've cut through that limestone, and they create what they call palisades, of huge embankments that are on the Kentucky Riverside as high as 500 feet almost as tall as the Washington Monument. Got to get that one in. Got some Park Rivers friends here from the mall. Um, 
Yeah, on the, on the Kentucky Riverside. And even on Little Hickman Creek, they're still over 300 feet tall. They are impenetrable to a Civil War army. It's, 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 it's ready-made. And so when the engineers come down to this spot, uh, this road coming right down the middle here, this is the Lexington-Danville Turnpike. And so Nicholasville is six miles north. That's the rail head up there. The engineers come down here and they see this area and said, man, this is an area. It's about 4,000 acres. It's already protected on the west, on the south, and even on the east. Not only that, down here, if you can see that little dash there, that is a bridge, a covered bridge. It was completed by 1839, and it's the only bridge that crosses the Kentucky River south of Frankfort, which is further north. This river, by the way, is running up the map. It's running kind of north, and it'll dump into the Ohio uh, around Frankfort. So, Turnpike, the Palisades, six miles from the railroad, and there's a bridge crossing the river. This was a slam dunk for the engineers. All right. This is an 1866 map of Camp Nelson. And what I like about it, and I know you can't read all the little things that are labeled here, but you can probably recognize the river, the turnpike, and there's Hickman Creek. The, the, the concentration of the, the infrastructure for the camp is really near the road, and a lot of it's on the east side of the turnpike. And today, this is the park. Camp Nelson National Monument. So we don't have all this down here or all this over here, but it's this area here on the on the east side of what is Highway 27 today for our Kentucky road travelers in the audience. Um, but the thing that the engineer said that, that it needed, that it didn't have, was protection from the north. So there needed to be a series of of entrenchments and forts that were built along the from the Kentucky River all the way over to Hickman Creek on the north side of the camp. Over 8,000 feet of entrenchments and forts would need it, uh, to be built to do that. Another complication flag. Brace yourself for this one. So, a lot of labor is going to be needed to build those forts. What's going on in the summer of 1863? I ask, standing in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. <laughs> but that's actually not the answer. It's the V word. Yeah, Vicksburg is going on. That's where Burnside's Ninth Corps gets pulled down to. Chris, I hit that wire again. Um, Ninth Corps is not at Burnside's disposal right away. He would really like to launch this deal down to Knoxville in the summer of 63, but he, need, he wants the Ninth Corps to be with him, so he has to wait for Vicksburg to be done, and eventually the Ninth Corps will come back. So in the meantime, all this work needs to be done. Who's going to do the work? This is crazy fascinating. Here's, the, here's, a, here's a really cool map that actually shows uh, the engineer work that's going to happen, all these forts. And incidentally, I said the park today is mostly archaeological, and it is, but a lot of these earthworks and these forts, they're still there uh, in an eroded state, but they're very definable, some of them more than others. Uh, my particular favorite one is Fort Jones down here. It's actually a stone fort uh, that's in good shape, really good shape. For those that are reading ahead, but uh, yeah, in August of 63, and again, Burnside's growing impatient. He wants to launch this thing, but again, he's waiting on the Ninth Corps. In the meanwhile, though, General 41 calls for 6,000 laborers from the Negro population of the country, quote, unquote, to construct military roads and assist the quartermaster at Camp Nelson. These enslaved people are used to build the forts and entrenchments at Camp Nelson, and their owners are paid by the United States government. One of the reasons this is so complicated and interesting is because we've started research at Camp Nelson. The military, as you might expect, kept roles of these impressed laborers, who they were. Typically their first names, the counties that they're from, their owner's name, right, because the owner had to be paid. Sometimes that's enough information for us to go back later and look at military service records and, and, and don't be, I don't want to misguide you by this number, but so far we know that there are over 90 of these men who were impressed to build these forts who will definitely become United States Colored Troops the next year 
at Camp Nelson. And 90 is a very low number. The only reason it's 90 is because those are the ones that actually had their first name and kept their owner's last name, and so they're traceable in the service record. It does not account for all the men who had the same first name, but we don't know their last name on the service record if it matches some of the impressed laborers. Incidentally, too, we've also noticed among the impressed laborers uh, in 63, Camp Nelson, there are at least nine women. It's interesting. We didn't expect that. Um, so more to come on that. But it's literally a story from picks and shovels to muskets and bayonets. And, and that's one of the really big stories at Camp Nelson. And that is not what it started out to be, right? It started out to be a supply depot uh, to, to help uh, assist with a large maneuver into East Tennessee. You probably know, if you did any kind of research at all on Camp Nelson before coming here, that it's known for, for being a recruitment station for United States color troops. And we'll talk about that. But that's in 1864. Initially, it was a recruitment and training station for white soldiers, Ten East Tennessee men who were having difficulty forming Union regiments in East Tennessee. They would come north into Kentucky and form here, also some Kentucky units. Also, there were refugees, white refugees from East Tennessee that came to Kentucky uh, seeking refuge. This is part of a, of a monument that exists at the park today where there was a large cemetery set up at Camp Nelson that in, that's civilian and military, including white men and women from, from Tennessee from this early period in the summer and fall of 1863. I just love this map because... It, you can see that you get a sense of the palisades mm -hmm. that are created by the river and by little old Hickman Creek. Huge palisades. And this is the 1866 engineer's map laid onto this. I did not make this map. This was a really smart person from the University of Kentucky. But, uh, but I think it's cool because it, it, you can kind of see the layers of the topography plus, you know, what the military is going to build there, some of the infrastructure. And, we'll, and, and here's the thing. I hate the death by PowerPoint thing. That was not my intention, but as I was telling Chris, I apologize in advance. There are some photographs in here, though, that you just have to see. There's no other way around it. All right. There are at least 45 photographs taken inside the camp during the Civil War, complete with people and animals, horses, mules, even some dogs. Uh, it's just too enticing. So let's start. There's the bridge. The bridge over the Kentucky River. There's only been three bridges to cross the Kentucky River in this part of the state. This was the first one, and it lasted until the 1920s. Then there was a steel bridge that lasted until the 1970s, and that bridge is still there today. And then in the 70s, there was a four-lane bridge that we use right now, the three bridges of Jesmond County. Um, the cool thing about that, though, is today... The stonework here that you see on either end of these buttresses, they're still there. So you can walk down there right now and see exactly where this bridge was. And I just think that's a really cool thing. And I, I guess I've, I've, become, I, I've become really close to the tangible things we have at the park that point back to the 1860s because there's not as many as we'd like. And when I used to work at Appomattox, there's lots of buildings there in the village. That's not the case at Camp Nelson. So where we have tangible evidence, I'm, I'm gravitating toward that. I'm going to use this map again to show you, to, to attempt to show you where some of these photographs are being taken. So we'll just hop around uh, the camp a little bit. I'm not going to show you all 45, but there's, there's a few, though, that you just can't miss. Okay, we talked about the White House, the Oliver Perry home. So there it is uh, during the war. Um, really interesting home, interesting design. But it, 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 our intention is to reopen it to the public. It's not open right now. It needs a lot of work. It's one of the many, many projects that we'll be working on over the next few years. Uh, but as I said, it was officers' quarters uh, during the war, and it existed on the very north end of the camp, near where the visitor center is today. So when you come into the park today, you're really at that northern edge up by the fortification line. Most of the camp is to the south. And we'll, we'll hop around and look at some of that. I love this picture. So... And again, I don't know how well, this is a beautiful setup, by the way. I love this. Uh, so the White House is up here in the north. You see this elbow-shaped set of buildings? Those are the warehouses that are down in this bottom. All right. So if you're up in the north, approaching from the north, 
which is really the only way an enemy could approach this camp, is from the north. You cannot approach it from any other direction because of those palisades. And so from the north, uh, there, there's a fortification line. There's a clear field of fire for about 1,500 feet beyond that line that they kept clear. If Confederate artillery was north of that, you can't even see the heart of the camp from where Confederate artillery, in theory, would be if it had attacked the camp. So it's kind of odd to me that all this is down on the bottom, and I'm thinking, well, that's all going to flood. But the thing about karst topography is it's very porous. You have these sinkholes, and the water goes down, and it just disappears. And it's going into these underground caves and caverns. Remember, this is where Kentucky's where Mammoth Cave is located. Um, and we have a little bit of that kind of stuff over here, too, in this bluegrass region. Uh, so this area, as low as it is, it doesn't flood like I think it would. And I, of course, the engineers knew that. But yeah, you can see the, all those warehouses, and there they are. These are ambulances that are all parked here. But the coolest thing of all about this picture is the White House. There it is, up on the hill. That's our landmark. The camp is large enough. It's got, I don't know if I said it, but it's got over 300 buildings, 4,000 acres. There's stables. They can stable 2,000 horses at once. They can corral up to 14,000 horses and mules at once. Um, so it's very large. There are multiple hospitals. Uh, and you'll see some of the other infrastructure. But the point is, it had its own prison. This is not a prisoner of war camp for Confederates. These are just the bad apples that are there in the camp. You get that many people together, you know there's going to be a few. Uh, this is actually right behind the visitor center today, this location. <laughs> we have this picture in our visitor center. My favorite thing when people see this is I just like for people to guess what it is. Some great answers. Yeah, exactly. Long before NASCAR um, or, or, or Indy formula racing, they, they could pick the animal up all at once and they would shoo him all, all four at one time, set him back down and bring him through. Again, you have to think industrial scale. They're not just shooing a few, a few mules. Um, they're doing these things by the hundreds. And I, I love these photographs, not only because of what they're trying to show you, but all the little, look at all the shoes down here, these farrier toolboxes and all the little things that you see in the backdrops of these photographs, the details. It's absolutely fascinating. The physical culture uh, of Camp Nelson is, is endless, uh, endless source of fascination. But yeah, they call it the mule shoot. And uh, no, they're not launching this thing. You know, <laughs> we've heard some crazy stuff. Uh, some of the Monty Python fans out there kind of have fun with it. But anyway, uh, but pretty neat. There's the magazine. This is down on the south end of the monument today. Um, the mag so the, the cool thing is this is facing south. This landscape out here uh, in the background today would be Camp Nelson National Cemetery. And we'll talk about how that fits into the story. Ordnance Warehouse. Uh, you can't really tell easily, but you can just see the... Um, the rooftops of some of the warehouse buildings over here. Um, oh, yeah, the bakery. Yeah. Not loaves, but what it says is they could serve, they could make and serve 10,000 servings of bread a day uh, at the bakery. And, and I don't know how well you can see it, but it says U.S. Bakery on the sign there. And what I love, of course, you see all the wood here that's needed to burn it, but look at all these, these barrels of flour. Just stacked up out there. You know, the Park Service is not going to rebuild these buildings. I mean, it would be fun, yeah. but that's not the kind of... But, it, you know, and it's funny, it's not even necessarily building it, right? It's maintaining it for years to come and all that stuff. But I think, I think it would be interesting to, to uh, consider some of the non-architectural features mm -hmm. of the landscape and some things that we could put back on the landscape that would give you some sense of the function of that area. And the other thing, too, is when you walk into the visitor center today or right outside, and again, the, the, the rolling green pastures, I'd love for people to, to get a sense of the scope and scale of just how big this thing was and all the things that were being done there, like a bakery or a prison. And... and Get a load of some of this other stuff. This is awesome. The camp had running water. And I found out after that, I thought, well, that's pretty, that's great. It wasn't even for drinking water. That wasn't even the purpose. 
The government put so much money into building Camp Nelson that they then started to think about protecting the resources. This is fire suppression. Crazy. Um, so get this. This is on the Kentucky River side. So this picture is right there. That's where the pump is on the river, and there's the line coming up. Okay, that square that you see there is not the reservoir. That's a series of stables right there. Those are the stables. The reservoir is this little square here, kind of in a bad spot in the map. But anyway, there's a 50 horsepower steam engine down here on the river. It, it, it uses an eight inch pipe to push the water up the hill 470 feet and to pump water into the reservoir, which is a 500,000 gallon reservoir. They could pump 125 gallons a minute into that reservoir. And then when you, when you can look really closely at the map, you'll see a line right there. That's a water line connecting the reservoir to a hospital there and here. There's also a line we know that will connect all the way down to the warehouses. Now, not to the barracks, the warehouses. And each one of those warehouse buildings has 50 feet of hose. And then, so if they're, in case of a fire, they could hook up to, they didn't call it a hydrant, but that's what it is to me, hook up to the hydrant and they would have water available to suppress a fire in the warehouse district. The water for the hospital was for, for cleaning, uh, cleanliness in the hospitals for patients. And I'm told by archaeologists that in those hospitals, there actually were some flush toilets. That's just amazing. Oh, before I go any further, you can see right there an animal. And I refer to that as our reservoir dog. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, okay, this picture I included because it shows just how fancy parts of the camp were. Now, the cool thing is you actually know where this is. Okay, we were, we were just at the reservoir. You see this U-shaped building here? That is this. That's the Sanitary Commission and Soldiers Home, which is what the sign says there. But look closely at this photograph. This is insane. Look at how nice this place is. There's landscaping, sidewalks, and look at that round thing right there. It's a fountain. And it's actually running. If you look at it, you can tell there's, there's, a, there's a, a spew of water there. A decorative fountain. Picket fences. How about that? Those are fun to paint. Um, so, yeah, this is, this is just an example of how kind of nice this camp was. They put a lot into this. I think this is also another one of my most favorite uh, images. It just speaks to the industrial nature of the camp. You see all the, 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 the cut lumber. Um, Wagon shoeing and harness shops. This is this clump of buildings right here, right along the turnpike, right along the highway there. Uh, so we know exactly where this is. Uh, a horse person, that's what I call them. There's horse people in Kentucky. Uh, we had a horse person on our staff last summer, and she pointed out, she, she was studying the picture, and she said, look at all that. Those are harnesses hanging on the, on the side. And this pile here, McClellan Saddles. Just a pile of them right there. Um, yeah, you can, you can study this for hours and continue to see new things. All those guys wearing aprons, uh, those farriers. Okay, back to the whole reason the camp was initially built. So finally in August, Burnside gets the Ninth Corps back, and now he's ready to move. He's got about 18,000 men. Now this map is very oversimplified, I apologize. Not all of these men left from Camp Nelson. He's got them scattered all over central Kentucky, and they will approach Knoxville from multiple directions, cutting off certain passes, controlling bridges and railroads, all the things that you would expect um, uh, and to move on Knoxville. And, and actually, uh, and I'm sure a lot of you know, uh, the move on Knoxville was fairly anticlimactic. Uh, it was taken essentially without a fight, but it set the stage for the rest of East Tennessee in the fall of 63. Uh, there's a big chess match going on from Chattanooga to Knoxville all the way up to Cumberland Gap. Uh, uh, Braxton Bragg Long Street is there. Um, it, that, that's a whole big deal. But that is supported from Camp Nelson. And I would like to um, promise not to read very much, but this is something I, I have to try to read. So on October 19th, 1863, 
So Knoxville has already fallen, but now we're looking at uh, sustaining the effort. And this is really what Camp Nelson's job was to do, right? Burnside's taking the Army of the Ohio down there. Camp Nelson's job is to support it. There's no railroad, so this is all overland. That's why there's so many horses and mules and wagons uh, to carry all this stuff. So the quartermaster at Camp Nelson, Theron Hall, writes this note to General Burnside again on October 19th. And this is a little bit tedious, but that's by design. I want you to hear this. I start today for Knoxville, 1,020 shelter tents, 5,000 caps and covers, 1,025 blouses, 144 hatchets and handles, 755 pairs carry trousers, 2,700 blankets, 36 pairs of booties, 156 pairs of boots, 600 cavalry greatcoats, 110 pairs of infantry trousers, 340 artillery jackets, 196 cavalry jackets. I shall load another train tomorrow if I can get men to drive. Captain Stewart desires transportation for ordnance stores. Which do you wish to be sent first, clothing commissary stores or ordnance stores? Please keep me informed what you want most, and I will send them first. Theron Hall, quartermaster. That's a lot of stuff. And you start weighing that stuff out. You can put about 2,000 pounds in a wagon. But the thing is, it isn't just the stuff you need to send down there. In that same wagon, you got to have the feed for the animals that are pulling it. So it depends on how far you got to take it, how much food you need. That takes away from the load that you're trying to carry. And this is just a sample. You know, we, we have these, these correspondence, and it's fascinating to read them. And you're talking about getting this many pounds from here to there and how much feed it's going to take. And my algebra teacher somewhere is just laughing. <laughs> you do need this after all. So anyway... Um, and notice, too, what he said about the order, right? Which one do you want first? So the other thing that we know about these logistics is when you send that first train, and that's, by the way, that's rough country, all right, from Camp Nelson. To, and I'm sure some of y'all have been down there and you know this, but this is hilly, it's rough, there's, there's rivers, there's, there's a lot of challenges uh, to moving that much material that far. And what Hall knows is the first train that I send you, you're going to get in reasonable time. But that second train, that could take a while because the first train's going to tear up the road and the second train's going to take that much longer. So think carefully when you tell me which one you want first because it may be a good while before you get the second one. Okay, so that's what Camp Nelson was supposed to be. And depending on who you, who you read and who you talk to as to how well they, they did it. This is a, shot, a shout out back to Jesmond County. This is a museum that's a, part, a shot in the museum uh, at Camp Nelson today that we've inherited from the county. They did, they did a wonderful job. But in January 1864, General Grant is thinking about Camp Nelson. He traveled to Lexington, Kentucky in January of 64 from Tennessee and on his way up. He, I have no reason to believe that he actually visited Camp Nelson. Some people think that he did. There's a newspaper account in Vermont that makes it sound like he was actually at Camp Nelson. But in only his own reports, he's basically going up I-75 through Richmond. And I don't think he comes through Camp Nelson. But he doesn't stop him from commenting on it. And he's actually thinking that Camp Nelson is not really something that should be maintained going forward. Because now the military objectives are no longer East Tennessee. They've gone out beyond that. And, and where Camp Nelson is, is not going to support what's going to be needed later in 64. And Grant's thinking, this is not something where we need to be funneling money into. We need to focus on other areas. So Camp Nelson's future is, is uh, really in question in January 64. But something was about to change, as we know. In the spring of 64 in April, General Stephen Burbridge, Department of the Kentucky, issued General Order 34, allowing enslaved men to enlist with the permission of their owners. And remember, this goes back to the, the fact that the Emancipation Proclamation did not apply to Kentucky. So this was a very conscientious military decision. And, and see, and you know this, Lincoln, of course, was navigating Kentucky very carefully. It's a slave-holding state. They're not all that excited about the Emancipation Proclamation or what it means about the war. So it's very carefully navigated. But finally, in the spring of 64, you can feel all the chips moving into the table, right? The November election is coming. This is it. We all know 64 is a massively important year. 
uh, determine the outcome of the war. And here it is. You see it at Camp Nelson. We're going to do this. Now, enlist with owner's permission. Yeah. Went over like a lead balloon. <laughs> but it didn't take long. A month later, Burbridge amended the order and said, you know what? They don't need the permission of their owners. If you can get there, you can enlist. And if you enlist, you will be emancipated. You, the man, the soldier, you will be emancipated. So there's something missing in that formula. But it was military necessity, right? That's what it was about. And when this happened in mid-May, the floodgates opened up. And I would just like to say, I want to keep, I know I've got to keep moving here, but I just would like to say that um, we'll never know how many people don't make it to federal installations around Kentucky. And it's not just Camp Nelson. There's a lot of places, Louisville, all, all kinds of places. Uh, but Camp Nelson is a big one because of where it is. It's, it, Kentucky's a slave state, but the bluegrass region is slave country. And so there's a lot of enslaved people in the 12 to 14 counties that surround Jesmond County. So it made Camp Nelson a huge hub for this order. And we know that there were lots of men that tried to get to these places and failed. They were physically stopped. Uh, but we know some made it. On July 25th, for example, there were 322 men that enlisted at Camp Nelson in one day. Uh, it's crazy. Over 5,000 in the summer and fall of 64 will enlist at Camp Nelson. Another 5,000 enlist at other places and are sent to Camp Nelson to organize into USCT regiments. But it all started here in the spring of 64. This is a photo taken inside the camp. These are cavalrymen, which means that they have to be soldiers who are either in the 5th or the 6th United States Colored Cavalry. Those are the two cab units that were raised here. When Chris invited me, I knew that I had to work Gettysburg into this program, and here was my way to do it. Richard Lilly, Private Richard Lilly. He was 16 years old when he enlisted at Camp Nelson. He is actually from Jesmond County. He was enslaved by a man named George Shanklin, uh, and, uh, who stated that Lilly was 16 years old when he enlisted. Shanklin was paid a bounty of $100 for Lilly's service. Uh, a common event for enslaved men who desired to enlist in Kentucky. Uh, this is obviously an amazing photograph, uh, courtesy of Adams County Historical Society, of, of Mr. Lilly attending the 75th anniversary here. And, and he wasn't obviously a soldier here at the battle, but was, and I would love to know his thought process to decide to come to, to um, the reunion. And Chris and I were talking before the program, and I think there was, what you say, Chris, maybe 45 or so United States Colored Troop veterans that did come to, to the anniversary. So obviously, Private Lilly was one of them. But amazing photograph. Awesome. Okay. Now we're in 1864. Now we are talking about USCTs. Um, the first military engagement that Camp Nelson USCTs will be involved with is the first Battle of Saltville, Virginia, in October 1864. This, this just... This is hard to even think about and talk about. And, and, and I'm not even talking about the, the, the men that were murdered after the battle. That's obviously horrific. But, but there's something else horrific about this. The, uh, the 5th and some companies of the 6th USCC that are forming at Camp Nelson, they are literally walking into camp. I'm, I know I'm going to kick this thing away. They, they are literally walking into camp in September of 1864, various dates throughout September, and they are thrown on horseback with infield rifles and sent to southwest Virginia. And there's just no way that they had any actual training. There's just no time. In fact, when you look at some of the official organizations for the 5th USCC, they technically form after October 2nd. They're not even technically a regiment yet, and they're already in battle at Saltville. And they're not just in it. I mean, they're in it. They, they're on the very far left of the federal advance on Saltville. That they take significant uh, wounded soldiers. There are about, about a third of all federal casualties at First Saltville are from the USCC. And I'm, I'm sure some of you might be familiar with the, the story of Confederate guerrilla champ Ferguson, who after the battle will go onto the battlefield and even into a hospital at Emory and Henry, what is now Emory and Henry University, and murdered between 40 and 50, most scholars believe, between 40 and 50 
uh, United States colored troops that have been wounded in the battle. Then they will return back to Kentucky. Uh, they will come back again in December of, of 64 and actually successfully uh, take the salt works uh, there. In uh, January of 65, the same, some of the same guys, the 5th uh, U.S. Colored Calf, they have the task of driving 900 head of cattle from Camp Nelson to Louisville. And on their way, and, and Company E specifically is sent to do that. They split the company up, half were in front of the herd, half were behind the herd. And as they're moving through Shelby County, Kentucky, and near a community called Simpsonville, they are bushwhacked. And the guys in the back half of the herd uh, are basically slaughtered. 22 of them are killed right there on the road. This happens to be an image of Samuel Trueheart, who not only is a member of the 5th U.S. Colored Cav, but is actually a member of Company E. He is from Shelby County, Kentucky. According to his service record, though, we believe he was at Saltville, but he was in the hospital later when this happened and was not with the company. But I wonder to this day, he must have known every one of those guys that got killed. I wonder how many of the men he knew that did the killing. And then later on, the 116th and the 114th uh, United States Color Infantry, they will be sent east. And as you can see here, um, the 116th, uh, they're sent over to the Richmond Petersburg lines in 64 deep bottom specifically. Initially, they'll end up at Fort Harrison for a while. The 114th is sent over in January, also Fort Harrison. The 114th will actually be one of the units that marches into Richmond when it falls in early April. The 116th, oh, and by the way, yeah, uh, uh, the 116th will actually be reviewed by President Lincoln in Petersburg before they will head out with the Army of the James, right? The 24th, 25th Corps, they're in the 25th Corps. That was the colored portion of the Army of the James. They will make the march and will actually be on the battlefield at Appomattox Courthouse on the morning of April the 9th. Uh, and the surrender will be, of course, that afternoon. So pretty, I mean, th their military stories are not long. They form late in the war, but they do manage to get in get into uh, some action. And then after the war. No grand review for these guys, right? So immediately after the surrender, uh, these two units, the 114th and the 116th, they're going to be sent to the Rio Grande uh, to, to do guard duty down there along the Mexican border. Um, and not just for the summer of 65. They actually are going to stay down there until uh, 1867. Uh, there's a community near the park today that includes some descendants of USCTs. And I was talking to one of those guys not long ago, and uh, he was telling me a, a family history, a family oral history uh, story that's passed down through the generations. And some of his ancestors were in these units. And he said the family story was that the guys that were sent down there sent word back, said that if they didn't come back soon, they were going to start speaking Spanish. <laughs> and I get it, right? Because they actually were down there on the Mexican border longer than they were in the Civil War. Um, so they're down there. And then, side note, when the 116th uh, is, is ready to come back, they're actually transferred to New Orleans. And then they're scheduled to come back to muster out in Louisville in January of 67. And 113 of the members of the 116th do not come back to Louisville. They do something else in New Orleans. Any guesses? My, I would say that they didn't have anything to come back to. One guess. Well, I think that's safe. Mm -hmm. But they had another opportunity in New Orleans that they took advantage of. They enlisted in the regular army. These are the first Buffalo soldiers. Okay, the men who enlisted are emancipated. But did the men come to Camp Nelson alone? Absolutely not. Thousands of refugees... African-American refugees also fled into Camp Nelson at the time. And when they first came in, General Speed Fry, who's the commander of the camp, was bothered by this because it was taking away time and resources away from the military objectives that he had. He was very focused on that. He was not expecting Camp Nelson to turn into a large refugee camp, but it did. Uh, and when it did, um, it was problematic. In fact, it was tragic at times. So, initially, a lot of these refugees were put on the east side of the highway where the camp was. One of the archaeology digs that was done there 
found one of the original refugee camps within the military camp. And they noticed that a lot of the artifacts were partially burned, a comb, a half dime with a hole in it, which we know was common among African-American families. Children wear these tied around wrist, ankles. Some of these things were found and they were burned and huge amounts of nails. And the archaeologists determined that what was happening, and we know this from historic record, in the summer and fall of 1864, as General Fry would get very frustrated with the overwhelming number of refugees coming into the camp, he would kick them out, called expulsions. Not the men who were soldiers and not anyone that was dutifully employed somewhere in the camp, laundresses, cooks, all kinds. Of, but if you weren't employed in the camp and you weren't a soldier, you were kicked out. There were, there were eight expulsions from August through November of 1864. The expulsion is late November of 1864, and the reason it's the expulsion is because there was an early winter storm that happened to be in central Kentucky at that time, and over 400 refugees were kicked out that night, and over 100 of them died uh, of exposure. I, I have to share this quote. Uh, Richard Sears is one of the few academics that has treated Camp Nelson the women and children of black soldiers in Kentucky were not free because they belonged to loyal Union supporters, not the rebels. They had not been freed by the Emancipation Proclamation, and they were not freed by the recruitment process in the state. They were property of loyal citizens, many of whom were leaders in the state government and the military. I just think that sums up the complicatedness so well. It's absolutely what's going on in 1864. There's General Fry. So the original, uh, there was an original area in here where the, uh, where the refugee camp was that was destroyed and burned. When the expulsion occurred in late November, the story went viral, as it could in 1864. It made it into newspapers in New York, Boston, Washington, and I'm sure other places. There was an anonymous letter sent out describing what had happened to Camp Nelson at the hands of the military command of General Fry. And when that got out, the order was immediately rescinded. Refugees were invited back in the camp. And by January of 65, they built this, known then as the Home for Colored Refugees. Row cottages, 97 of them. But not just that, a mess hall, a school, administrative buildings, a formal refugee camp. For, it included women, children, and the elderly. Also, on March 3rd of 1865, Congress would pass an act that said that any enslaved person that made it into any federal establishment would be emancipated. They didn't have to be soldiers. Anybody. If you could make it there, you would be considered emancipated. I think that gets overlooked largely because the war doesn't last much longer. And the focus attention is, uh, is going to turn to the 13th Amendment and other parts of the emancipation process. But this did happen, and, and it's an event at Camp Nelson that actually resonated in the halls of Congress, um, even if it's not well known. I'm proud of this photo because this is something that we did last November. It was our first program as a national park unit. And we had a, a luminaria, a remembrance event. So we have 102 luminaria surrounding the obelisk that's at the cemetery that's, that's in, the, in the camp. Uh, plus we have two additional luminarias out here, and they represent all the people that perished as a result of expulsions whom we don't know, we don't have a record of. There were, surely were more than 102. Um, this was a wonderful event, and I, I was actually fascinated sharing with Chris I was actually surprised at the number of African-American community members that came out for this event. Uh, it was kind of inspiring. Uh, it's a very, very powerful story. Now, um, so we mentioned the, the row cottages. This is a, an amazing photograph of those row cottages. Here they are, 1865. And actually, the camp's not going to close when the, when the war ends in the spring of 65. Well, for one thing, some of the regiments were out in the field still. And their family members were still here at, 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 at the refugee home. So the camp is going to stay open until the summer of 66. Here's another shot. I love this because you can see the row cottages over here. But here you see some of the other buildings, the school, mess hall. 
And you also see here how the refugee camp would grow. It was dynamic. It wasn't just 97 static buildings. People would move in. And so you see the tents, and then you see the, the homemade shacks and things that just pop up on the grounds as, as the numbers would swell. There's a shot of the school, actually. I just like this shot, but I, I included it because it, it shows the kind of the green pastoral landscape. Now there's the, the obelisk. So that, that obelisk is in an area that was known during the Camp Nelson days as cemetery number one. They had a different cemetery that was down on the southern end of the camp, below, below the ordinance, that south end. That was cemetery number two. All right. But the thing is, though, um, this cemetery had civilians, soldiers, children, white and black people. It was an integrated cemetery. When the camp was being closed in 1866, the government made it clear that everything would be taken down. They would dismantle it. And they would sell the, the hardware off to the local population. The local population made it very clear to the government that... When the camp closed, this was not to become a community of African Americans. That's why they had to tear everything down, because they didn't want anybody to stay. But the cemetery here, number one, the soldiers in this cemetery were actually reinterred and moved to the cemetery on the southern end of the camp, which was a military only cemetery, cemetery number two. In 1868, that cemetery would be renamed. As, as Camp Nelson National Cemetery. And it's still there today, and it's still an active cemetery today. So I was talking about the dismantling of, of the camp. This man, Reverend John Fee, founder of Berea College there in central Kentucky, he was on, in the camp, and he was one of the folks that was trying to make an opportunity for the recently emancipated folks that were in the camp who obviously didn't have a lot of opportunities waiting for them when the war ended. Fee and his wife... She was instrumental in this. They decided that, well, if they're going to tear down the camp, what he would try to do is actually buy the land that the home was on. And so he talked to the white man that owned that land. So when the government closed the camp, all the land reverted back to the original owners and became farms again. The Perrys moved back into the White House, kept farming, tobacco and other things. The man that owned the land over here uh, was was being told and by the community, you better not sell this land to those soldiers or their families. And of course, I don't think they would have had much money anyway, uh, other than the money they were making as soldiers. But John Fee and his wife stepped in and uh, and he said, well, we'll buy it from you. And he did. They agreed on $10,000 to buy that, that whole lot of land. He ended up paying 7000 for it, but he got it. And what Fee wanted to do was break it up into tiny little parcels where you could have a house and a family. And then he wanted to sell that land to the former soldiers and their families. He did. He was somewhat successful. They created a community there called Ariel at the time. Today, this community is called Hall. Or actually, everybody locally calls it The Hall. Going over to The Hall. And The Hall today is, I would say, a mixed race community now. It's very small, but there are descendants there today of United States color troops. So some of the families did stay. And I know it's kind of an interesting story to think that there's this big community of United States color troops and their families that stayed at Camp Nelson after the war. My, my only concern there is, though, it, it doesn't really accurately represent the fact that most did not stay. Most left. They went to Ohio where there were jobs, or they went, some even went south and pursued agricultural pursuits, which they knew. In the late 1870s, many will go to Kansas, exodusters. So not many actually stayed, but some do, and, and will thrive there for a good little while. I'm going to wrap it up here, just down here, well, not here, the river bends around here. Down here, uh, in true Kentucky fashion, right after the war, by 1869, I believe, a distillery was built. <laughs> And which employed people, including people that lived in the aerial community. And that thrived pretty well. So they had a school, there was jobs, there were small homes, thriving. Probably better off than a lot of other African-American families elsewhere in Kentucky, frankly. Until 1919, then the distillery business took a hit with prohibition. But uh, today, 
This is what the National Park Service has. We've got, uh, this is actually seven acres over here in the Hall community. The thing that's there now is the Fee Memorial Church. That church was built in 1912, so it doesn't go back to the Civil War, but it was built by the same congregation that started in the camp. And it's still there today. That's a recent photo. And yes, we have work to do there too uh, that we will do. There's a shot of cemetery number two recently. These are members of the 12th United States Colored Heavy Artillery reactivated. So Camp Nelson does have a cannon crew, which is really awesome. And some of these guys are descendants uh, of, of, of soldiers from Camp Nelson. In action. So the sun is rising on Camp Nelson National Monument. And I appreciate the time you all coming out today and, uh, and the opportunity to speak. Uh, to an amazing, to be in Gettysburg and talking about Camp Nelson is awesome. It is a summer of 1863 site, though, uh, and I appreciate everyone's time. I know it's, we're up against the clock now. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them, but thank you for your time. So please come to Camp Nelson. Yes. Yeah. Why is it named Camp Nelson? Camp, why is it named Camp Nelson? It's named after General Bull Nelson, who was a, a federal general uh, in that part of Kentucky. Um, he, he was at uh, Camp Dick Robinson, which was about 10 miles south of Camp Nelson, which was a recruiting and training station before Camp Nelson in the early part of the war. He was actually killed in a hotel in Louisville, Kentucky, by a, federal, a, a fellow federal officer named Jefferson Davis. Uh, they, they had a disagreement in the lobby of the hotel there, and Jefferson Davis shot him. He was killed, and then they named this camp after him the following year. Great question. Yep. There have a, there's a photograph of Bull Nelson, and he was aptly named. <laughs> big man. Big man. Yes, sir. The picture of Reverend Fee, he was holding something in his hand I didn't recognize. Sandwich. What's that? Looks like a sandwich. Yeah, you know, I'm not sure specifically what he's holding. I, I, you know, I'll be honest. I'm not. I, well, go back to it. I've always assumed that it was a Bible, but I can't really say that definitively. It does look like a sandwich, though. Is that what you said? Sandwich? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But yeah, like I said, he he was a founder of Berea College, which was an integrated integrated college. Uh, in the 19th century. Um, really, really interesting character. But his wife, Matilda, actually had the money. And uh, so, yeah, what, what they tried to do at Camp Nelson is really fascinating. It's, again, it's part of that complication. Uh, it really is. And part of the legacy. So, you know, it's a Civil War park, but as you can see, it's also an early reconstruction park. You know, you're getting in some of those very early reactions to reconstruction policies uh, and, and what are things going to look like after the war. And, and Kentucky's full of fascinating stories about, about race relations and politics and all of that changing. And so I think that aerial community, the hall, is a great opportunity for us to not only talk about what Camp Nelson was, but the legacy of the war itself. In real time, real life, families living there, uh, white and black, uh, and dealing with all the changing politics over the years. So, yes, sir. Is there any uh, thought of purchasing more property on the west side of the uh, bank? Yeah. Just the uh, church, right? Uh, I lost it. Oh, there we go. Um, there, I would say fairly there is thought, yes. Uh, there's nothing really in the works right now. Um, we are trying to get a boundary expansion, we call that. National Park Service have a boundary extension. It doesn't mean that we take the land. It just means that it's eligible to be part of the park if the landowner was ever willing to sell. There's, there's two and a half acres right here. See that little, I call it Utah, uh, this little thing here. And we are trying to get the boundary expanded so that in the future that might be able to become part of the park because it's right on the turnpike. And you know those harness and wagon shops with all that unfinished lumber? That's pretty much right there. It's a great archaeological site we'd like to add to the park. But to your point, over here, this map is actually not right. We actually only have about half of that. This area to the north, that actually would be where those large white structures were, the mess hall and the administrative uh, building and the school so what we have in that southern part is just the church. That would be far more interesting over here. And I think it's possible, but I don't want to get ahead of myself. You know, right now we're just trying to establish the monument, get basic documentation of the resources we have, plans in place, treatments, and all those sorts of things. 
We have a cultural landscape plan we're working on now, histor historic structures report for the Fee Church and the White House. And, uh, you know, first things first kind of thing. But I think you're I'm tracking with you. I think there is undeveloped land over there that's actually on the Home for Colored Refugee site that I think would be fascinating to obtain. The archaeologist, Dr. McBride, did some digs over there, and he's recommending that, um, that it would be a, a nice addition to the park. It doesn't have to be a lot of acres either. It's, we're not talking huge acres. It's pretty small, but it would be significant. Is any of the pump house still left or any of the piping or anything? That's all on private land now, and um, if you're on the water, you can see where it was. There's some foundation pieces, but none of the structure. Now, some of the piping we have recovered. So we have some sections of the piping in our museum, the piping that actually ran through the, the, the camp itself, none of the eight inch pipe that I know of, but that section there coming up the, from the Palisade is all on private land. I know the landowner and talked to him, very nice. They're very, they're very, they're fascinated with their connection to Camp Nelson. But yeah, that water, that running water story just kind of blew me away. <laughs> yeah, great question. All right. Yes, sir. What was the pipe made out of? I'm not sure that all the pipes were the same, like the pipe that ran up from the the uh, the uh, the pump station. Um, the the piping in the camp itself looks lead to me. That it's lead piping, and it's interesting too because oh, it's maybe about an inch and a half, two inch diameter, but it'll have these swollen places throughout it. So it's not just a straight pipe. It'll it's straight for about a foot, and then it'll have like a bubble, another and a bubble, and and apparently I'm told that it allowed for temperature changes and expansion that the pipe wouldn't break easily, uh, is what I'm told. I'm not an engineer, but the first thing I saw when I saw the pipe was like, what are all those bubbles for? And they said that it gave it, uh, it, it allowed it to expand and contract without breaking, um, but that's all I know about it. There's probably more out there. <laughs> That, by the way, that water system, that whole system, uh, the federal government paid $29,000 to build that system. Yes, sir. Was it ever put in use? Were there any fires on the camp? No, no, no documented fires in the camp, um, but it definitely was used at the hospitals, for sure. Um, yeah, I've never heard of a documentation of a fire in the warehouse district. Now, we know the old refugee camp was burned. Um, and I was talking about the, all the nails. The archaeologists said that what they did was they took an area and after they evacuated everybody, they pushed all the building materials into a pile and burned it. So that's why you end up with all these nails in one spot. But some of the personal effects were partially burned. Like I said, I'm really struck. The thing that sticks in my mind was a comb, a wooden comb, and it's just sheer, you know, half of it's burned. And uh, so, you, you know, Camp Nelson, it, it reminds you when you see the artifacts that come there from there archaeologically, how much of, a, of an intertwined civilian and military site that it is. These archaeological digs, they're not, they're rarely just pure one or the other. Like even in the Home for Colored Refugees, uh, there's some uh, digs over there, and he expected, well, this is all civilian, but you'd see military buttons and things in there too, because the guys, that was their families, you know, and so they're, they're inter intertwining in that space. Oh. Yes, sir. You were saying that this was a state park before? County. County park. County park. So when was that park established? Late 90s is when the county... So what happened was Highway 27 expanded to from two-lane to four-lane. And when it did, and also AT&T was putting a fiber optics line in along it. So it was a big expansion project. And when that happened, they hired archaeologists from UK, University of Kentucky, to come down because somebody knew that that was running right through the old Camp Nelson. So archaeologists came down and started doing some, some digging in the corridor of the new road, and they were finding all kinds of stuff. And I think what happened is, locally, Camp Nelson was not something that was celebrated. You know, like you didn't have veterans coming back and putting monuments out on the field. That dig in the 90s, I think, really put it on the, the radar of a lot of local people. They were saying, what? They thought Camp Nelson was just the cemetery, the National Cemetery down the road. And a lot of people really weren't thinking of what actually Camp Nelson was originally and how big it was. It was massive. And so that dig, I think, was really what sparked a lot of interest. And then some people 
preservation-minded said, hey, we should, uh, we should maybe look at trying to preserve this site because it was all just three farms still. There were three big farms that made up most of the old camp. And so in the late 90s, the county started an effort with some other partners and some funding partners, and they bought one, they bought two farms early on in the, in the early 90s and very early 2000s. And then the third farm, which is the middle part of the monument today, called the Glass Farm, that was purchased in 2015. And then the monument, 2018. So, back there. Uh, did you say that the reservoir is no longer there? It's not. The reservoir, the pump station and the pipeline and the reservoir are all on private property today. So that area uh, that where the reservoir was, was developed, uh, not, not sprawling residential sprawl, but there are some houses around there. And so, yeah, the reservoir site is, is gone, unfortunately. Um, a lot of the stuff on the west side of the highway was not, we went on, the development went unchecked. And the, the community of Hall, you know, developed. And so a lot of those resources like that one were, were lost long before the county had a park. Yes, sir. What was the camp's actual source of potable drinking water? There are springs inside the camp, and some of them are still there today. In fact, one of them is called the Officer's Spring. It's just south of where the visitor center is today. In fact, they did uh, some improved stonework around it. It's quite beautiful. And it's known as the Officer's Spring. And it's just down from the officer's house, the White House. And we're, we're pretty sure that the Perry family was using that spring themselves. The military just expanded it. Uh, kind of fortified it with some stone walls around it, made like a pond area where it made it easier for to get the water out. Uh, but we've seen orders that strictly said that only officers could use that water there at the spring. Then it trickles down through the rest of the camp, and there are ponds further down for other people to use. But I, th I found that really interesting that they it was like a hierarchy, literally the higher up the water was, that was for officers, and then downstream, others could use it. Um, so yeah, there, water's not a big, water's available there. There's springs and ponds, even to this day, and that's really good for farming. And, they, and farmers could easily dam up these little pot springs and make ponds out of them, and so that, that, that wasn't the issue. And I suppose that's why, when I saw that big running water system, and I'm thinking drinking water, that isn't what they actually needed. They had that. It was for fire suppression. Good question. All right. Excellent. Thank Ladies you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you again so much. I hope to see you tomorrow. I want to thank you for Andy Atkinson. Thanks. Thank you. 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 Thank you.